All right, as you can see this morning, we are not in the fellowship hall getting to eat good food. Next month, we'll be back over there. We just had so many people again gone this week on vacation that we thought it'd be better to have a regular service this time, but we'll be back in August 7th to start this again. We'll have a meal and share time together. So, um, Also, I want to remind you guys, since Lonnie didn't, but in the back of the room here is a little white mailbox where you put all your tithes, your offerings, your credit cards, teeth, gold teeth, whatever you want, put in there, and we'll collect it later. So, All right, this morning, uh, I'm going to continue on with the same message for the last, I think this is the fourth or the fifth one, on the kingdom of God. Uh, so I just want to Open up again with a word of prayer. Just, Lord, because we're going to be looking at a lot of scripture this morning, uh, a lot of different verses. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word. And, and, Lord, we just lift it up before you. And, Lord, your word is life. Lord, your word says that your word would not return void. So, we just ask right now that you would speak to us through your word, Lord. We treasure it. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right, so just quick review. We've talked about the kingdom of God here for, like say, this is, I think, my fifth probably time. And we started with where it all started back in Daniel chapter 2, where Daniel interprets the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, in fact, gives him the dream and interprets it, and then tells him that during the time of the fourth kingdom, which was the uh, Roman Empire, because you had the, uh, the Babylonian, the Medes, the Persians, and then you had the Greek Empire, and then you had, last was the uh, Roman Empire. So sometime during that, that time of their reign in the world, the kingdom of God was going to come. And it says that it will be a stone taken out of a mountain that will crush all the other kingdoms, and that it would never end. And so as Jesus comes... And he begins to teach about the kingdom. The disciples and all the Jews are really perplexed because uh, it was not looking anything like what they thought it would look like. They were expecting something totally different than a a suffering servant who would be coming. Someone who began to teach in parables instead of kicking the Romans out and establishing the kingdom of Israel. He was teaching teaching uh, in parables about the kingdom of God starting in the midst of you, growing from inside like a, uh, uh, a mustard seed, something small that grows and eventually fills the whole earth. And so their concept of what, uh, what the kingdom was going to look like was totally different. So they were really in many times perplexed because they didn't understand why this was happening because it wasn't their expectation. And I think that's always something for us to think about also, that even in our, all our different end-time scenarios, that we need to have an open hand because you may be surprised, and I might be surprised at how things actually unfold. So I want to start today, and uh, I want to just look at, we're going to be looking at mainly at um, Matthew chapter 21, <clears throat> but I want to read you out of chapter 10 of Matthew, just two verses, five and six. And it says, Jesus says, These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go, rather, to the lost sheep of Israel. So why did he put that qualification on it? Why did he say, don't go to the Gentiles, only go to the house of the lost sheep of Israel? Because before that time, as we're about to enter into the New Covenant, it was all about Israel. And if you go to Deuteronomy 32, where it talks about the, you know, the 70 nations and how uh, the Lord gave the other nations over to other little g gods. But he says, Israel is mine. And so he takes Israel... They go, through, they go through covenants, the Mosaic Covenant, and 
But now things are about to change. So when he first sends out the 12, and then later he sends out the 7, he has the same instructions, only go to the house of Israel. Because they had to have the opportunity to hear the word and either receive it or reject it. And of course we know that for the most part the uh, leadership rejected the word. But before it could go to the Gentiles, it had to be offered to them first. So now I'm going to, again, chapter 21. And I want to read, let's see, verse 23. Because I want you to get the setting. Twenty-one and verse twenty-three. It says Jesus. Let me fix the right. Yeah, Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priest and the elders of the people came to him. Okay, so I want you to get the setting because the rest of this chapter is this setting that he's in the temple. Okay. He's talking to the chief priests, the elders, the leaders of the nation of Israel. And things are about to change. He had just talking about how uh, he, they had asked him a question, you know, because he had cleaned out the temple. And they said, Who, you know, what authority do you have to do this? And he said, well, I'll answer that question if you answer me. Was John the Baptist, you know, was he basically from the Lord? Or was he from man? And they refused to answer because they thought, either, you know, whichever way we answer this, they, they feared the people because they believed he was a prophet. And so he's in their face right now. Through this period, see, things have changed from chapter 10 to now 21. So he's confronting the leaders of the house of Israel. He's in their face. He's very confrontational right now. And so he gives this parable first of the two sons in verse 28 because he had just asked them the question about John the Baptist. Okay. So he says, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what the father wanted? The first they answered, and Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. The tax collectors, which were some of the most hated people in Israel, and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe in him. So again, he's given this parable against the leadership of the nation of Israel. Chief priests, Pharisees, the elders. Okay, then it goes into the parable of attendance. Okay, and this is a, a very in-your-face parable, one that really confronts, and as we go through it, you're going to see, actually gets them to proclaim their own judgment over their nation. So it says, listen again to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. Now, a vineyard all it symbolizes in the Old Testament, symbolizes Israel. He put a wall around it, he dug a wine press in it, and he built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. Now when the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect its fruit. Okay, I want to stop right there. I'm just going to turn over uh, to Isaiah chapter 5, just because this is actually my reading, uh, but this Bible reading yesterday, and I'm going to read the first seven verses, but I want you to see that the vineyard is definitely the nation of Israel. 
Verse 1, it says, I will sing for the one I love song about his vineyard. My loved one has a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it, cleared it of stones, and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it, and he cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a good crop of grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judea, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have done for my vineyard than I have already done? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I am going to do to the vineyard. I will take away its hedge, in other words, its hedge of protection, and it will be destroyed. I will break down the walls, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel and the men of Judah or the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. So some of that's almost quoted from Isaiah chapter 5, saying the same thing. The vineyard was Israel. And if you think about it throughout their history, in Isaiah's time that we just read, what happened was, you know, after the civil war in Israel came two nations. The northern kingdom called Israel, made up of ten tribes. The southern kingdom made up of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And they were warring against each other a lot. But in the northern kingdom, in 522, after sending prophet after prophet, warning after warning, the Lord used the Assyrian Empire very bloodthirsty people. We would consider them evil. He used them to come and bring destruction upon the nation of Israel. He completely destroyed it, destroyed uh, Samaria, which was the capital, and Bethel, where they used to worship, where they had idols. And their biggest sin was spiritual adultery. They started worshiping other gods. After being warned over and over, they worshiped the gods of the nations around them. And as a result of that, he brings the Assyrian Empire. They destroy Israel. The survivors are taken into captivity into the north, and they're lost to history, those ten tribes. Okay, that was in, in 722 B.C. About 120 some years later, 586 B.C., the southern kingdom which is Judah and Benjamin. It's where Jerusalem's at. The Lord uses the Babylonians to come in and destroy the temple over, uh, and killed the majority of people. Those who survived were taken into captivity to Babylon. But this time it was only for 70 years. So they're, they're there in Babylon for 70 years. Jeremiah prophesies that after 70 years you return. So some of them come back to Judah. They rebuild the temple under Zerubbabel. And the nation is established again with those two tribes. So that's where we are back in Matthew 21. Okay? So they've had two judgments completely destroying the nations. And he's about to warn them that a third one is coming. All right, so I think I left off after 34, so start there, verse 35. And obviously in this parable, the landowner is the Lord, is God the Father. And it says, the attendant seized his servants, verse 35, they beat one, they killed another, and they stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the attendants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son, obviously Jesus. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the attendants saw the son, 
They said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. And by the way, this is about to happen in about two and a half days. From this, this is the time frame before Jesus is about to be crucified. He's about to be killed. So you got, the, you got this time frame of he's in the temple. He's got two and a half days to live before they kill him. So then he asks a question, verse 40. He says, therefore, now Jesus is asking the leaders, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? So they answer, okay, and they're going to speak their own judgment. And they say, he will bring these wretcheds to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Now Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scripture the stone the builder rejected has become the capstone? The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Again, that stone that was taken out of the mountain from Daniel chapter 2 that would destroy all the other kingdoms. Verse 43. Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parable, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. So Jesus tells them, after they kind of prophesy what's going to happen, he t- tells them that the, therefore the kingdom of God is going to be taken away from you. Remember, all throughout history now, it's been about Israel. This thing's going to be taken to you and given to the Gentiles. And it happened just about 40 years, 39, depending on, on when you, you place the, the crucifixion. And this time, the Lord uses the Roman Empire to come in and destroy Judah, destroy Jerusalem, destroy the temple. Remember when Jesus says, there's not going to be any of these stones. You know, the, the disciples are saying, you see this magnificent building, this great stone. They said, see these? Not one's going to be standing on another. Because the Romans came in and destroyed it. Over a million of the Jews were killed. The survivors were then taken into captivity throughout the world. And so from 70 A.D. to 1948, the nation of Israel failed to exist. But it was given, and the kingdom is being transferred to not only the Jews, but also to the Gentiles now, where you and I have interest into the kingdom of God. Now, the very next parable, chapter 22, again, there was no divisions, you know, chapter division or verses when it was written. So this is the same time frame. This is the same place. He's in the temple. He's confronting, again, uh, the Jewish leadership. And it's a parable called the parable of the wedding banquet. So stay there, but I'm going to go to uh, Revelation chapter 19. I'm going to read something there. So, so put this in your memory as, I, as we come back to this. But in Revelation 9, 19, verses 6 through 9, it says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of a rushing waters, and the loud peal of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. 
Then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Do not worship me, I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. All right, so back to the parable. Verse, chapter 22, verse 1. So Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king, or heavenly father, who prepared a wedding banquet for his son, obviously Jesus, and he sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet, Israel, for them to come, but they refused to come. So he sends out an invitation. You, you guys are invited. Come. But they refused to come. So then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, fatted calf, have been butchered, and everything is ready Come to the wedding banquet. So he sends out another invitation saying, everything is ready. Everything you need is provided. All you have to do is come. Verse 5, but they paid no attention. And they went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed his murders and burned their city. Which again is going to happen in 70 AD. The very things he's spoken. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite them to the banquet, everyone you find. So the servant went out to the street and he gathered all the people that they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guest, he noticed a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Remember in that passage in, in uh, Revelation 19, it says that clean linen wedding clothes were given to those who were invited, which is the righteousness of Christ. This man did not have that. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness for there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 14, For many are invited, but few are chosen. Many of your versions will say, Many are called, but few are chosen. In other words, the invitation goes out to everyone. But not everyone is chosen, and depending on you're, whether you're a Calvinistic or whether you're Arminian, that has different meanings. But either way, the word goes out, the invitation goes out, some respond, and it says, but few are chosen. In other words, it's always going to be a remnant. It's never going to be the majority. And we don't know who will and who won't. Our job is to witness, is to invite so they'll be part of it. But we don't know, and you don't know. That's why we to go to everyone. So this is a major, a major paradigm shift, if you think about it. <clears throat> because the way the kingdom came, it didn't come at all like they were expecting. And then it was all about Israel. And it's only a remnant of the Israelites, Judah, that received the invitation, and who responded. The majority rejected it. 
And so now it's going from this centric Judah, you know, it's where we get the great, you know, the great Commission going through all the world, you know, in Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the world, because this thing is going worldwide. And I'm taking the nations back from the other gods. It's going to the whole world. And so this is such a paradigm shift because if you think yourself as a disciple, I'm one of the disciples. I'm, a, I'm from the tribe, of, like Paul was, from the tribe of Benjamin. You know, it was, it was basically kind of all about them. And yet he becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, if I would have been working, I'd have done different. I said, well, Paul, you're, you're a Pharisee, a Pharisee. I think I'd make you the apostle to the Jews. But that's not the way the Lord wanted it. So we have this huge paradigm shift. It, it's, it's a huge change, and we're going from not being about Israel to being about the world. So I'm going to read a couple of verses kind of to emphasize this as we go through the New Testament because this change did not happen overnight. Because you can imagine, if you were steeped, if you grew up in Judaism... And that's all you knew. And it was all about you. And it was about the Mosaic Covenant. Then that's, you don't turn a, a, a large ship around quickly. So it took time. It took decades for this word to get out and to realize. In fact, that's why we have the Judaizers uh, throughout the New Testament who was always coming to the Gentiles saying, okay, it's great that you have received the Messiah, but you need to begin to follow you need to follow the Torah, you need to follow the commandments, you need to follow the festivals and all those things. And so Paul was always having to fight against that. So Romans chapter 2, we're going to just look a couple through New Testament passages. So Romans chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 28 and 29. Because I want you to think about this. Before, it was all about genetics or it was about your heritage. Were you a Jew? Were you one of the 12 tribes? Or were you not? But you come to verse 28, and he says, A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the written code. So he's, he's, he's addressing this whole issue. It's not about genetics anymore. It's not about your bloodline. This is going to everyone. Whoever, it's, it's about inside. It's about those who truly believe, those who have turned to the Lord, those who have Christ. You're either in Christ or you're out. And it doesn't matter where your heritage comes from. Okay, in Romans chapter 9, verse 6 through 8. It says, it's not as though God's word has failed. Because before in this chapter, by the way, he's talking about uh, the Jewish people. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Hmm. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words... It is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. So, again, he's showing it doesn't matter. It's not the natural children who are God's children. Now, for us, we don't have a problem with that. I mean, there's no issue because we live... When we live now in the new covenant, when we, but at that time, that was a huge change. I mean, that was a major difference. You mean 
since I'm a Jew, it doesn't make any difference now. No, it's whoever is in the heart. You're either in Christ or you're not. And one more in Romans chapter 10, in verses 1 through 4. He says, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law, so that there might be righteousness for everyone who believes. Again, this word is going out to everyone all across the world. Chinese, it doesn't matter what your background is. It's even possible for Irish. I know most of you don't believe that, but it is. I can say it because I'm Irish. Okay. So, Galatians chapter 3. Give you some more. Right past Corinthians. Galatians 3. We're going to look at verses 26 through 29. And it says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourself with Christ. And the key verse, 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So again, he's having to make this point over and over again. That we, as Gentiles, have been grafted in. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 2 to 6, <clears throat> And this is all through Galatians. This is where he's battling so much for the Galatians because they're a Gentile church and they have these Judaizers coming in saying, you must follow the Torah, you must follow the, the, the commandments. And so he comes back in verse, actually throughout the whole book. But in verse 5, or chapter 5, verse 1, it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm and do not let yourself be burdened again by yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. By faith... We eagerly await through the Spirit the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So again, going over that same point again, it's not about genetics, it's not about your heritage. It's about belief in the Son of God. And in chapter 6, verse 15, it says, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. You know, sometimes that that causes issues because you have what's called, in certain stances of the body of Christ, a replacement theology, which which says basically that Israel has been completely replaced uh, by the church. 
And there is some truth to that. In fact, in that word, it would seem that way. But also at the same time, there's promises throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. You know, you go to Romans 11, where it talks a lot about what is yet to happen in the future. And the covenant with the land that is still in force. And we see that since 1948, we see them back in the land. So there is yet purpose to be fulfilled. And at some point, they will be grafted back in. But the only thing that counts is a new creation. And that's what Jesus said. You know, when you're in Christ, you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Regardless of your background, you are included. Now, the last one I want to give you, Ephesians, is just this next, the next book over. But Ephesians chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 11 through 22. Because this is the part where it talks about one new man in Christ. And it says, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are called Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcised, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that at the time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship of in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise you were without hope and without God in the world but now in Christ Jesus you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace he who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and the regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace and in the one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, which he put to death their hostility. So in other words, it says the two new men, the one new man, which is the Jew and the Gentile, he says the only way that could come about was by abolishing in his flesh the law with his commandments and its regulations. So now Gentiles, everyone in the world has an opportunity. Everyone can be invited. And just like in the parable of the, of the, of the, of the uh, wedding feast, you know, he, he sends out an invitation, and then he sent out another invitation, said, everything I have for you has been prepared. Come. Come to the wedding. But one was too busy. You know, one was going to his farm, another one was going to his business, too busy to take time to really respond to the invitation that was given. And so we have this huge paradigm shift going from it's all about Israel to it now it's about the world. The gospel going forth, the good news of the gospel going forth all across the world, every nation, every tongue. And it says that every nation of tongue, in heaven there's going to be every nation and every tongue. And so we have this, this progression of from going from the Old Testament to the New Testament, and again, it just didn't happen overnight. It took a while for this gospel of the kingdom to take hold. And that's why all of us that are here today are here, because it has now gone out, and we have received it. And at times it may seem like, you know, the Lord was... was uh, you know, he gives that parable about the tenants and, and, and tells them what's going to happen. Actually, and again, they, they, they confess what their own judgment's going to be. And if you remember when Jesus was going to the cross, and it says people were following him, the women were following him as he was carrying the cross, and, and he says, don't, don't weep for me. Weep for yourself. Daughters of Jerusalem, weep for yourself for what was coming. Because the kingdom of God was about to be taken from them 
and it was taken to the Gentiles. And in that judgment, like I said, over a million Jews were killed in the process. And then they were taken to captive throughout the nations. And now, in 1940, or starting in 1948, the nation of Israel was reborn. So we can begin to see that, that you know, the clock, end time clock, began to ticking. See things happening in our world today. But it took a while. It took, it took a long time for this to get grounded in the lives of people and to realize that this was a huge, huge paradigm shift. And you'd have to go back again to Deuteronomy 32 where, where the Lord says, Israel is mine. The other nations are not. That changed, and now we are in the process of Seeing, in fact, one of the end times uh, signs is that every tongue and every nation will have a witness of the kingdom of God. And we're getting very close now to having the word of God in every language, in every subset, you know, within, there's so many different dialects in the world. And through people like Wycliffe and different ones who have over the years been steadily going and giving the word of God into their own languages. And so we are getting to that place now where all the world is going to have a witness of the kingdom and an invitation to go out. And after that time, the day of the den Charles comes soon in. So we're getting close. We're getting closer every day. But I think it's important for us to see the, the history of what's happened in the past where we are today and how that happened and why it happened. And again, for Israel, whether it's the southern kingdom or the northern kingdom, it was because of spiritual adultery, because they worshipped other gods, the gods that were around them. And even though the Lord would send prophets, continue to warn, continue to warn, continue to warn, there comes a time when he says it's enough. And for us, that seemed very hard. It seemed very, you know, there's a lot of people being killed. But God is the righteous judge. And those are the things that we have to trust. That God is the judge, and his judgments are right. So let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that, Lord, throughout history, Lord, you have been guiding, directing. You had a plan before the creation before the world began, you had a plan and you had a purpose and you're working that out, Lord. And so, Lord, we just say we don't always understand, but, Lord, we trust you. And, Lord, you said that your ways are not our ways. Your ways are much higher than our ways. So, Lord, we just, we're just thankful and grateful that we have been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord, that you have included us in that. So, Lord, we, we love you, Lord. We love you. And we want to give you our hearts and our life. In Jesus' mighty name. All right, I want to take, we're going to have one last song, and we're going to have time for prayer. Anybody need prayer for healing? Another, th- another area I just felt like this morning that the Lord wanted to do is, is regarding finances. So if, if, you knew, if you're have a struggling right now with finances, you need a breakthrough, uh, feel free to come up and we'll pray for you. Just believe that it's time that, that even in the midst of economic pressures, and I think those economic pressures are going to get worse, that the Lord has provision for his people. But we need to be asking, we need to be looking, we need to be listening to the Lord that in the midst of all that, he will provide for us.